Well, all of these things, social changes which are associated with immigration or blamed on immigration, even though the immigrants are not responsible for the transformation of the society that is going on at this time, but they feed into politics. Um, another thing which feeds into politics is the rise of urban political machines, particularly the Democratic Party in these cities, like New York, begins to mobilize immigrant voters uh, as a major voting bloc. Tammany Hall, the famous, one of the major political machines of the Democratic, there were usually quite a few of them, but Tammany was one of the more famous ones. It was a combination of a political operation of getting people to the polls to vote and a sort of primitive welfare society. The local ward boss would give you a turkey on Christmas or help you out if you got into trouble with the police or maybe find your cousin a job when he uh, turned up here from Ireland. In the absence of any public welfare programs, there was no social security, there was no unemployment relief, uh, no disability payments, nothing like that. Um, the political machine sort of takes that, takes that place of, of, at least in a small way, of providing some safety net to people, poor people, in exchange for their votes. Now, an interesting difference between then and now is this. You did not have to be a citizen to vote. You had to have declared your, it, there was a five-year naturalization period. That is to say, if you declare your intention to become a citizen, you have to wait five years to do whatever you had to do then to become a citizen. But in that five-year period, you could vote. So you could vote basically the day after you arrived if you declared your intention of being a citizen. And uh, today, I think you have to be a citizen to vote in, in all the states. Um, so so the, the Tammany Hall and other, they organize, they're organi organized very locally. Often saloon keepers are very connected to this mobilization of immigrant voters. Um, in the 1850s, Fernando Wood, I've mentioned him before, you know, the, 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 who's in that Lincoln movie, Fernando Wood becomes mayor as the head of a major, of a really highly organized political machine based on immigrants, based on the police, where he gets jobs for Irish on the police force, and, and immigrant gangs as political agents, often roughing people up at the polls, marching around trying to intimidate voters uh, from the other side. Um, and they takes over the mayor, mayoralty and uh, does uh, quite well for himself. Um, now, I'm going to say something very unpopular among many historians today who don't know what they're talking about. I mean, who disagree with me. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of common misconception that when the Irish arrived here, they were not white. They had to become white. How the Irish became white. And then there's books that everybody does, so, so all of a sudden is not white. How the Jews became white. How the Italians became white. Let me let you in on a secret. They were white. <laughs> they didn't have to become white. Never was an Irishman preventing from voting because they weren't white, even though you had to be white. You show me an Irish voter who's a, who someone said, you can't vote because you're not white, and then I'll say, okay, they had to become white. Never was an Irishman hauled up for miscegenation, for marrying a non-Irish person let's say, a Protestant person. No, a black person who married a white person was committing a crime in New York and just about every other state. They were white. The problem is that the people who study these so-called whiteness studies assume that once you're white, you're sort of equal. But that is unfortunately not the case. White people can be treated unequally just the same as anybody else. Equal opportunity, discrimination here. So, you know, they were treated terribly. They were discriminated against. They were forced to into all sorts of uh, unfortunate positions. But they were, but whiteness was not, lack of whiteness was not their problem. And um, they were seriously exploited, but that does not mean they were not white. So this whole business of the, uh, is, to me, uh, just a, a, a mis misleading kind of idea. Um, but the other key aspect of this, as I mentioned before, is the growing presence of the Catholic Church. The church was the center of community life in the old world and becomes that in the new world also. 
And under the influence of this Irish influx, the church in America becomes Irish dominated. The priests, the hierarchy become more and more Irish, where it didn't used to be in 1810 and 20, most of them were English or French, uh, and much more accommodationist. The, the church in the earlier part of the century tried to lie low. They didn't want to antagonize the majority Protestant population. But under Archbishop John Hughes, a very important figure in the history of this period, Archbishop Hughes, the church becomes in the U.S. a very militant church. Um, it tries to proselytize. It tries to expand Catholicism. Uh, Hughes says, no, Catholicism is going to be the major religion in the United States. We are going to convert people. And this alarms native-born Protestants much more than the more uh, self-effacing sort of uh, Catholicism that had existed a generation or two uh, earlier. Uh, Hughes also strengthens the church hierarchy, uh, imposing much greater discipline from the top upon, uh, you know, on other uh, priests and other figures in the church. Um, he fought for aid, public aid for parochial schools, for Catholic schools. In fact, this is an important little thing. When William Seward was governor of New York, 1838 to 1842, Seward, a most Whigs, if, if you were a nativist, you tended to be more associated with the Whigs than the Democrats. The Democrats are mobilizing these immigrant votes. Seward thinks it's sort of like what's going on in the Republican Party today. In the Whig Party, there were a lot of anti-immigrant, and then there were some who said, you know, we better try to appeal to these guys. There's no, we, we, if we just denounce them all the time, that, that's a losing political proposition. So Seward was like the, I don't know, the Jeb Bush of the Whig Party. You know, Jeb Bush is now saying the Republican Party's got to get with it with immigrants, not just be hostile to them all the time. Seward, Seward tried to work with Hughes to actually get state funding for the parochial schools that Hughes was setting up, tried to limit anti-immigrant sentiment in the Whig Party. It didn't quite work very well, but 20 years later, as we will see, when Seward is a candidate, the leading candidate, for the Republican presidential nomination in 1860, the nativist element in the Republican Party absolutely will have nothing to do with Seward. Because of his sort of effort to be, to be good to immigrants 20 years earlier, they needed a candidate who, while not overtly nativist, was acceptable to them, and that turned out to be Abraham Lincoln. Um, so Seward's actions in 1840 reverberate 20 years later on the eve of the Civil War. 